With all of that in mind, you do need some background information, but no notes are needed in this section. You and Snowball, you guys have been planning this dive trip for ages. You're on board Captain Jack's dive boat, and the plan is to dive three shipwrecks off the coast of North Carolina. You leave Blind Bay Marina as planned, and you head out to the first shipwreck called the Vickery. You and Snowball pass the time with Captain Jack by telling some dive stories, and every now and then Captain Jack feeds popcorn to his pet parrot named Kirby. After a short boat ride out to the Vickery, you and Snowball get geared up, Captain Jack ties onto the surface buoy, and you jump into the water, waving goodbye to Captain Jack. He'll be back to pick you, back, pick you up in two hours. You start to descend, and soon you see the shadow of the dive boat departing. You and Snowball reach the top of the shipwreck. You know the Vickery came to rest at an upward angle, with the front of the boat higher than the back. You look for the big hole in the side of the shipwreck, and when you find it, you go in first. As you clear the opening, you turn around to warn Snowball of something sharp near the opening, but as you do, an iron grate suddenly slides into place, cutting you off from Snowball, who remains outside. Since the dive boat has already left, there's no sense in Snowball surfacing. It's best that he stay with you at the Vickery to offer whatever help he can from the outside. Since you have two hours worth of gas in your tanks and you need one hour to ascend safely, that leaves you one hour to get out of the Vickery. With all of that in mind, now is a good time to start taking notes. You take stock of your surroundings. You see that you're wearing a dive computer on your wrist. You also have a powerful flashlight, a waterproof notebook, and whatever other gear is standard for a wreck dive. Although visibility inside the ship is not great, you look around to see what you can inside the wreck. Your flashlight illuminates things wherever you shine it. You see that behind you, there's an iron grate. And on the other side of that iron grate is your friend Snowball. The ship is at an upward angle. When you look to the left, that's toward the front of the ship. The deck rises on a slope, and the front of the ship is at 65 feet of depth. If you look to your right, that's at a downward angle, and the stern of the ship rests at 110 feet of depth. To your immediate left against the wall, there's a chest of drawers. Continuing clockwise around the outside of the ship from there is the ship's windlass. That's a spool for raising and lowering chains, such as the anchor. Continuing clockwise, you see a bunch of holes in the hull on the opposite side of the ship from where you are. Next to that are bar shelves and a cabinet. At the deepest part of the ship is the propeller. And to your immediate right, there's a pile of bungee cords and fist-sized cannonballs. In the center of the ship, you see the ship's wheel, as well as what remains of the ship's three masts. What would you like to look at or do first? All right, uh, can we take a look at the propeller? Sure, you do head down to the back of the ship toward the propeller. As you get close to it, you see that it is an eight bladed propeller with one blade painted a different color from the other seven. There's a lot of seaweed growing around it. You try to spin the propeller, but that seaweed seems to have clamped it firmly in place. You don't want to upset the seaweed, so you leave that alone, but you do see on the deck near the propeller, there's a sign that reads, for Morse code only. Okay, well. Do we know Morse code? You do not. You will not need any outside knowledge in the game. All right, well, I don't see anything that we can do with this right now. So can we check out the bar shelves? Sure. It's unusual for there to be such an extensive bar on a cargo ship, but maybe drinking was the only way to pass long days at sea back then. As you look at those bar shelves, you see there's a bunch of glass bottles still on the shelves. They are in a wide variety of colors, as many colors as you can imagine. All of the bottles are either small, medium, or large. So do I have different sizes in the same color, or are yep. there... You have bottles of every possible color, and each of those bottles is represented in three different sizes. So you have a fuchsia bottle, in small and medium and large. You have a periwinkle bottle in small and medium and large, and so on for every possible color. All right, um, are there anything inside? Is there anything inside the bottles? Yeah, you stick your head inside the bar shelves, look around a little bit more closely, and you see that all of the caps, corks, and labels have been lost to the ages. These bottles are filled only with seawater. As you look at the 
cabinet bar shelves that they're on, there's nothing really special there. There's nothing in, on, or under any of these colored bottles. All right. Well, since they're in the same vicinity, can we check out those masts? Sure. As you take a look at the masts, you're reminded that the Vickery was a three-masted ship. And as such, you see the remnants of those three masts. The bottom of each mast is still intact and attached to the bottom of the ship. A few feet up, each mast stump is broken off. You see that the mast stump closest to the bow, you see that it's green and of medium height. The middle mast is red and the shortest. The mast stump closest to the stern or the back of the ship is blue and the tallest of the three. On the top surface of each mast stump, there's a round indentation that seems to have been carved there. What size is that indentation in relation to the size of the bottles? Yeah, you see that the outer circumference of the bottles, very, very similar to the inner circumference of these. So it looks like it would hold a bottle quite nicely. So what you thinking? I think that we put the bottles in, the, in those divots. A, a green medium bottle, a small red bottle, and a large blue bottle. Sure, it sounds like you want to grab a green bottle off of the bar shelves, and you're going to place it here in the position, something like this. Wow, that's a terrible bottle. You get the idea. You're going to put a green bottle on the green mast. You're also, sounds like you're going to put a small red bottle on the small red mast, something like this. Is that what you're asking for? That is. All right, and then we're going to place a large blue bottle on the large blue mast. That one's going to be a nice big bottle, something right about there. And as you do that, you actually cause two things to happen. Nicely done. Well, the first thing you notice is by picking up the three correct bottles off of the mat, off of the bar shelves, you pick up the three correct bottles, nicely done. And in doing so, you notice that the bar shelves and all of the remaining bottles slowly retract back into the wall behind them. And a panel slides into place, forming a wall where the bar shelves used to be. On that wall, there's a painting. The painting's of a ship. The ship has a figurehead. Now commonly, the figurehead on a ship is going to be a mermaid, but in this case, it's a cute little dog. In the dog's mouth, there's a keychain, and off of that hangs a single old-fashioned blacksmith's key. Now, what I said is that two things happened. First, all of this business about the panel, the painting, the dog, and the key, that's what happened whenever you picked up the bar, correct bottles off of the bar shelves. But by placing the correct bottles on the masts, you hear a slight grinding noise, and you can tell that the propeller has started to turn. As you head back to look at it, you see that the seaweed that had been clamping the propeller in place now forms patterns on